Dear colleagues, in partnership with NDT, Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, the official journal of the European Renal Association, Markus at Home welcomes Professor Ian McDougall in London for a discussion on renal anemia inspired by Dr. McDougall's review paper on treatment of anemia in chronic kidney disease patients, which is Andreas Kronbichler's and my NDT pick of the month. Dear Ian, we're very happy that we may host you for a second time. Thanks, Gunnar. Thank you. Dr. Ian McDougall is Professor of Clinical Nephrology at King's College London and R&D Lead for the Renal Department at King's, as well as the South London Renal Comprehensive Local Research Network Lead for the National Institute for Health Research Network. He has led seminal multicenter clinical trials on anemia, including his pivotal trial, which is the largest randomized clinical trial so far on iron treatment in dialysis patients. Thank you very much, Gunnar. So uh, this is the paper that I was invited to write for by the the current editor of NDT. He introduced this new treatment standards series for the journal, uh, which was to explore the current uh, treatment standards in various uh, complications and conditions associated with chronic kidney disease. And uh, uh, the idea was to also show the, the potential developments also in this field. So this is the paper that, uh, Gunnar, you asked me to uh, comment on. So before we had EPO, we relied heavily on blood transfusions before the 1980s. I'm going to show one slide on blood transfusions next because they still have a role in certain instances. But of course, the mainstay of treatment is still EPO and iron. And of course, I'll talk at the end a couple of slides about where we're going in anemia management, which is this new class of drugs, orally active, the hip stabilizers. So talking about blood transfusions first, uh, clearly it's the fastest way to correct the anemia and the most effective if you've got a patient that has uh, hemorrhaging, severe blood loss, uh, life-threatening condition, you have to give blood transfusion. There's nothing else as fast and appropriate in this context. But also blood transfusions may have a role in some chronic severe anemias that are refractory to treatment with EPO and iron, such as the anemia of malignancy. The problem with blood transfusions, there are three really, they, they don't last very long because of the short red cell lifespan in uremia. Uh, so they need replacement again if it's a chronic anemia. There's the risk of transmission of infectious agents and this sensitization to HLA antigens, which can render uh, renal transplantation problematic. So I was asked as part of the template for this treatment standard approach to list. And the idea is that you have a prescription for this review. It's not just an opportunity to write what you think you want to write. It's, an, it's a template. And one of the things the editor wishes is a table of all the currently available uh, treatments for the condition under review, which of course was the anemia. So this was the opportunity to list all the currently available erythropoiesis stimulating agents and iron therapies, both orally, uh, oral uh, therapies for iron and intravenous iron uh, for use in uh, CKD anemia. Uh, what we know about using these agents is that they're highly effective Correcting anemia, and we, we, we've we always thought a hemoglobin range about 10 to 12 gram per deciliter, and it's somewhat astonishing that that really hasn't changed very much. And I'll come back to this at the very end of the presentation, uh, between a hemoglobin between 10 and 12 gram per deciliter. But we know that if we aim for this, the main benefits for the patient are summarized here. They, there's overwhelming evidence that it reduces blood transfusions, both in dialysis patients particularly, but also non-dialysis CKD. It improves quality of life, especially the physical domain of quality of life, and it improves exercise capacity. The patients can exercise more. And there are definitely benefits on the heart, uh, which I showed many years ago, and also Gert Meyer also showed uh, in some of his uh, seminal work three or four decades ago. But we've also come to recognize from uh, randomized controlled trials, and I won't go through them, I think everybody knows which ones they are, that uh, going above a hemoglobin of 10 to 12 grams per deciliter is not a good idea. It will, uh, particularly from the three studies, uh, further reduce red cell transfusions. That's That's been proven with the TREAT study. And it may even improve quality of life and exercise capacity a little bit going a bit higher, but at the expense of 
uh, a, a definite increase in uh, cardiovascular adverse events, notably stroke and venous thromboembolism. And there may also be this uh, increase in cancer death. Now, why does this happen? Because we always thought that normalization of anemia would be a good idea. I think this review by Vaziri and Zhu, uh, published in the journal we're talking about today, NDT, um, and this is a lovely review summarizing why these high levels of erythropoietin that we expose our patients to uh, causes these adverse effects. So it's negative effect. This is the basic science on this, the biology uh, on platelet function and endothelial interaction. They're just negative effects on these um, physiological mechanisms. And that is thought to cause some of these thrombotic and other cardiovascular events. So we've learned a lot about intravenous iron and Gunnar in his introduction. Uh, made reference to the pivotal study, which we published now five years ago, just last month in January 2019. And uh, this study perhaps reassured many people who previously thought that intravenous iron was a bit toxic and might result in uh, oxidative stress increase and uh, maybe increased in uh, risk of infections. And we found from this study, it was a short term, uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term anyway, uh, the high dose arm of the intravenous iron arm of the study had a significant reduction in the risk of the primary composite uh, uh, outcome of no, all cause death and non fatal cardiovascular events. And perhaps more strikingly, when you look at the secondary endpoints, there's a 31% reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction in these dialysis patients, and a 33% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure in this study. So these were the positive effects in this study. In, in addition, there was a approximately 20% reduction in both ESA dose and transfusion rates. And importantly, there were no significant safety issues in this study notably uh, no increased risk of infection, which was one of the things that concerned a lot of dialysis physicians using a lot of intravenous iron. Moving on to the just last part of the talk, which are these new agents, the HIF stabilizers, uh, otherwise known as the HIF prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors. These are enzyme inhibitors that inhibit the enzyme hypoxia inducible factor prolyl hydroxylase. And I've listed these here. Again, I was asked to do this as part of the template for this NDT review by the current editor. Uh, I've listed the agents, uh, their brand names, uh, the uh, manufacturers, the studies that were uh, used to get approval in some uh, countries. And I've also shown the approval in the USA and also in Europe. And it's not been a universal approval, sadly, because there have been some concerns with these agents and the regulators particularly the FDA, have been very cautious in, in what they're allowing uh, to be approved in clinical practice. Uh, how do they work? Well, the, the, the plus of them is that they upregulate not only the erythropoietin gene, and therefore you get more endogenous erythropoietin produced by the patient, but also a number of iron regulatory genes which might increase uh, iron availability. And they're highly effective in correcting anemia and may even have a role in the patients that we have had difficulty with over the years, the epohyperresponsive patients due to inflammation, where they don't respond very well to conventional ESA therapy. Uh, the HIF PHIs might have a, a role in this uh, situation. And of course, they're orally active for anybody that wishes to uh, take tablets rather than injections. The downside of these drugs are several. Uh, they not only upregulate EPO and iron, but unfortunately uh, upregulate a lot of other genes, several hundred other genes, in fact, which um, could be uh, harmful. And, and there are some safety concerns with no long term uh, data at all to be able to reassure us at this time uh, about uh, things such as cancer risk and so on, because the studies have been too short to be able to address these concerns. So these remain concerns. Uh, they haven't necessarily been proven, but there have been some concerns and signals in some of the phase three trials. And of course, uh, although it's great that this is tablets, uh, this uh, is not so great for some patients who already are complaining to their physician that they're taking too many tablets already and they don't want to take another tablet uh, daily or, or three times a week, which is how these tablets are administered. So in the review, I've uh, summarized in table three, the safety concerns, 
of these agents. I've listed them all here. I'm not going to go through them in any detail. There are plenty of reviews and uh, uh, and you can read the, the current review on these where there's uh, elaboration of the reasons why these safety concerns exist. But there's quite a list, uh, a, a list here. And the ones in particular that we might be worried about was again thromboembolic problems and uh, this tumor risk or, or increased cancer risk because we know there's a potential for these drugs upregulating uh, VEGF, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. And of course, that's not good for patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So these are some of the safety concerns. But um, the, a lot of the, these uh, concerns need uh, more studies to be able to be definite about this. So I was asked to summarize in a figure what the standard of care for this uh, condition of anemia and CKD was in 2024. And I think it remains very similar to what we had 20 years ago. So in some ways, some people might think this is an old fashioned review, but things haven't changed much. So the first thing physicians need to do is to exclude other causes of anemia, particularly ones that you can correct uh, before you even think about anything else. And there are a number of other, there are lots of other causes of anemia that are uh, potentially uh, present in CKD patients. So exclude these first. Uh, once you've done that, you look for iron deficiency because that's very common in CKD and is easily correctable by either oral or intravenous iron. Uh, so you can measure these uh, iron markers, and if there's any doubt, give some in, uh, iron supplementation. Then the final hierarchical approach to this anemia treatment is ESA therapy, and that can be either a poison, the short-acting uh, recombinant human erythropoietin, or the longer-acting analogs, darbipoietin alpha or pegylated epoietin beta. And then more in, uh, recently, these... Um, uh, new drugs, the hif hydroxylase inhibitors, orally active, could also be used in, in this context. So just to conclude um, uh, where we are with anemia management in CKD in 2024, uh, there is no doubt uh, that ESA therapy has transformed the management of this condition over the last 30 or 40 years since we first had recombinant human erythropoietin in 1989. And We've come to recognize we shouldn't overcorrect anemia and normalize anemia, uh, but um, leave the patient in a target hemoglobin of between 10 and 12. What is new, I think, in the last few years is intravenous iron is not the toxic drug that we thought it was, maybe, or many people thought it was uh, a few decades ago. And in fact, the benefits of intravenous iron are increasingly recognized. And these um, benefits in the pivotal study on cardiovascular outcomes were perhaps um, not only just reassuring, but quite enlightening for the benefits of intravenous iron and complements the growing literature in heart failure uh, of benefits of intravenous iron, particularly in heart failure hospitalizations. The HIF PHIs, uh, very elegant science, and uh, three people got the Nobel Prize for the science uh, and development of these drugs. Uh, they definitely will correct anemia. All the studies uh, show that they improve the uh, hemoglobin, uh, but there are some genuine safety concerns, um, which we can discuss if necessary after. Um, and th there's no long-term uh, uh, safety data at the present time, so we await that. And then just finally, this is my last slide, um, where if you wish any further reading, so we know that the um, the the KDGO um, guideline on anemia uh, published in 2012 is currently being updated, and hopefully we will have a, a new uh, publication in the next year or two um, on uh, what the working group feel is the optimum treatment of anemia in CKD. Uh, this is work in progress uh, that the work group of uh, KDGO anemia uh, are currently working on. Um, in the meantime, we have two controversies conferences, uh, again, organized by Kay Deagle, um, uh, which have informed this working group. Uh, one, the first one uh, listed at the top is uh, on iron management in CKD and uh, makes reference a lot to the results of the pivotal study. And the one below is on HIF prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors, this new class of drugs that I'm talking about. So these are two controversies conferences that the reports will summarize all of the literature known at the time of their publication. And the National Kidney Foundation in America also convened uh, a scientific workshop group 
uh, which which I was part of, and uh, their report is published in uh, American Journal of Kidney Diseases, uh, ADKD. Uh, so it's a um, um, perhaps um, just a, a, another approach, a lot of overlap with the um, KDGO report, uh, as you could expect. And then just a final thing to say, in addition to NDT and the uh, European Renal Association, is this uh, European Renal Best Practice Group. Uh, they have also looked at HIF PHIs and have a publication in press that is probably going to be published before you're even listening uh, to my uh, video. It's uh, not out yet at the time I'm talking, but is expected any day now. So thank you very much for your attention, Gunnar and uh, Andreas, and I look forward to uh, some discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ian. That was great. And I really enjoyed reading your review. I'm not an expert in anemia, to be fair. Um, but uh, my boss actually gave me some questions and uh, some comments. So one of, uh, of his comments was, if you look at the normal hematocrite study from Bessarab et al. in 1998, you have this very nice figure number three, where you see if you actually achieve the target of 42%, your modality is actually not that high and not increased. But I think the the uh, mortality of those actually very use a lot of EPO to try to achieve this very high hematocrit. That's actually the, the main problem of, of such patients. How do you explain that? Uh, that is absolutely correct, Andreas. And we've known this for now, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Um, the patients who do badly in all the normalization studies, not just uh, treat and, and normal hematocrit, but also choir and create, are the ones that uh, struggle to get the target hemoglobin in the study. Uh, in other words, the resistant hypotherapy. And, the, the more, and, and these are the ones that are um, inflamed usually. Uh, there are other causes, of course, of resistance, but by and large, they have chronic inflammation. And I think it's fair to say, in these particular patients, we do not know uh, whether um, correcting anemia is actually of benefit. And of course, they need the highest doses of EPO because they're resistant. So going back to that slide I showed of Vizirian Zoo, as soon as you go high dose, you're getting very high levels of EPO circulating in the patient. And that is thought to cause some of these adverse uh, cardiovascular consequences uh, in the patient. So I, I think that's the explanation. The resistant if they're resistant because of inflammation, and we know why inflammation will uh, cause resistance to anemia, we know this because we had anemia of inflammation long before we had EPO. Um, the, 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 there's something about inflammation directly suppressing the bone marrow or uh, whatever, and um, the, the, to overcome this uh, blockade, if you like, of, of an inflammation, you need a lot of EPO, and that's where the problem comes. So you're absolutely right. The ones that need a little bit of EPO, uh, of course, correct their hemoglobin very well, and they do the best. And we know that patients who don't require any EPO, there are a few patients uh, polycystic patients on dialysis who actually manage to keep a normal hemoglobin uh, without any EPO uh, because their cysts are producing some EPO. Uh, so they, they do the best of all. So, I mean, it's nothing to do with hemoglobin. Uh, we know that. It's absolutely to do with the interaction between trying to achieve a hemoglobin that you can't achieve in inflammation. So that is the explanation that we've had. And interestingly, as you may or may not be aware, uh, the major um, new development uh, in inflammation in dialysis patients is to block interleukin-6. And there are phase three trials now blocking uh, these inflammatory cytokines uh, to try and get uh, rid of the inflammation more. And, they, uh, and this will hopefully also help the anemia. So this is the strategy. It's inflammation and anemia together is, is, is unfortunately a bad combination for the patient. So actually leading on to this, is hemoglobin really a good marker we should target? Let's say no, 10. I, yeah, 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 I don't, I think you've, it's a very good question, Andreas, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure it is actually anymore. Uh, there are certainly people uh, in the world that believe, uh, one of them is um, Professor Dira Levin in Vancouver in Canada, who almost uh, is, 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 is quite outspoken in this. Why are we targeting a hemoglobin? We don't, um, 
you know, we put patients on a drug for blood pressure and, and we try and increase the dose. And, but we, we don't, um, um, we put them all in the, the, the same dose. We're not increasing the dose if we're not achieving um, a satisfactory uh, result. And I think it's not the hemoglobin that's the issue. Uh, the issue is further uh, back upstream in what's causing the anemia, which is inflammation. So it's like flogging, as we say in English, flogging a dead horse will not make it run faster if it's dead. So if you can't get the hemoglobin up, why flog it with lots of EPO? Uh, uh, it just is not a good idea to try and get the hemoglobin. So I think hemoglobin targets, unfortunately, I think are here to say it will be very interesting to know what the KDGO working group eventually decide on target hemoglobin because it hasn't changed uh, for decades at 10 to 12. Uh, KDGO are looking at that amongst other things very carefully uh, in the, and when they publish later this year or next year, uh, it'll be very interesting what they say. Do you think that, you know, when considering the HIF BHI studies, most of them were non-inferior, but also not superior to, to EPO in terms of um, correction of hemoglobin. Do you think if we would be more liberal in the target hemoglobin that these agents would be superior to EPO? Um, I think in the resistant patients, they would be. And, and so it depends how many hyper-responsive patients go into the trial. And, and there have been attempts to look at these drugs in hypo-responsive patients. They clearly work better. So if you have half of your population hyper-responsive, for example, these drugs would definitely be superior uh, to EPO. But uh, I think at the moment, it's far too early to be able to say we should be going higher hemoglobin with these agents. You, you also mentioned, and this was part of a lot of the discussion, the review infections and the risk of infections. There was this small revoke study, which was terminated early because of the signal to have more infections. But you didn't find that in FinCKD and also not in Pivotal. Do you have any explanations why there have been such a huge difference actually in the occurrence of infections? So I, I, Rajiv Agarwal, who was the author and lead of the Revoke study, and I have talked about this, there is no obvious explanation. I mean, he definitely saw infection signal uh, in his study, and it's not a subtle one. It's quite, uh, it's quite uh, robust. I think it's fair to say this was a very small trial, uh, mm -hmm. only about 100 patients randomized, whereas fine CKD was 626 patients randomized. Pivotal was uh, well over 2,000 patients randomized. Uh, so I'm not saying that that's the only explanation, but there are a lot of other studies looking at infection in heart failure as well, and we haven't seen increased risk of intravenous iron infection risk in these trials. Uh, so his is the outlier of all the randomized controlled trials. It's a definite result um, and I can't ignore it. I haven't got an explanation, but I would say in meta-analyses, uh, looking at intravenous iron in heart failure and in other conditions, we're not seeing a, an infection safety signal that uh, was seen by Rajiv Agarwal in, in Revolk. So hitherto unexplained, can't, uh, can't say why. Coming back to that, so in Pivotal, you have done this great sub-study published in JSON looking at infections, and it was not probably a surprise that more patients having a uh, being dialyzed over a, a catheter have more infections. Do you have any strategies in your clinical practice to mitigate this risk in, in this population being dialyzed by a catheter in comparison to a fistula? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and we, we did see that, and, and it, it wasn't only this study, I think we've known for years that the highest risk factor almost for infection in dialysis patients is a, is a, a, um, a synthetic uh, material catheter, um, particularly a temporary one, uh, a very high risk of sepsis and infection. Um, what do we do to mitigate? Well, obviously use fistulas where possible and try not to have any synthetic uh, dialysis lines, but we're all aware that there are patients who cannot have any other vascular access apart from uh, a, a catheter. Uh, so what can you do about them? Well, um, 
there are lots of uh, uh, studies looking at ways of mitigating this. Uh, nothing to do with intravenous iron, of course. Uh, that's a whole a different ball game. Um, I, 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 I personally don't have any uh, strategy myself, uh, other, and it, it, other than not to necessarily limit in, uh, intravenous iron, because uh, the patients we looked at this very carefully in that Jason paper. And, the patients that got lots of intravenous iron, uh, obviously the high dose arm, um, they didn't see any ris increased risk. So it, it reassures us that it's, uh, we don't have to limit intravenous iron as one of our mitigating strategies. Um, but I'm not an expert in all the other strategies trying to reduce infections in catheters. There's a lot of literature on this. So another practical question, what is your ferritin target basically in the non-dialysis population and, and when they are reaching end-stage kidney disease? Well, I think that we haven't a very, very strong evidence for a, a, a ferritin target. There are some people that actually uh, are nervous of ferritin targets. The, interesting, the cardiologists in the last year or two have completely gone off ferritin as a marker of iron uh, insufficiency. They don't believe it. They don't, they, they've, they've done analysis to show now there's very strong data and there's a very nice review by John Cleland uh, in the UK uh, trying to say we, we shouldn't be using ferritin anymore. We should be using transfer and saturation in heart failure uh, as our index of um, iron insufficiency. We haven't done that in renal yet. We're still measuring ferritin and TSAT. In terms of the target in non-dialysis patients, um, I definitely would want them to be above 100 microgram per liter because I think the inflammation visit. I prefer them above 200, but I wouldn't necessarily be uh, driving them. In, in the fine CKD study, they got up to 600 or 700 in the high ferritin arm. Um, but it wasn't an outcome study, so we can't really say that that was a better uh, ferritin target, only that it did seem to uh, meet the primary endpoint of reducing the need for other anemia therapies. But I, I, I think the evidence for ferritin targets in non-dialysis CKD isn't particularly strong, and cardiologists would say, forget them, just go for TSAT above 20%. Good. And um, one final one from my side. So in, in Innsbruck, we have uh, we have uh, um, abolished, I would say, fair inject. And we are just using monofair now because of this JAMA paper published in 2020 showing that hypophosphatemia is a huge issue when you use um, fair inject. What is your practice, actually? Do you have any suggestion here? What to use? Which kind of IV iron would you recommend? I think it's the volume of intravenous iron that's the problem. I mean, there's no doubt that um, ferric oximaltose causes um, a, a transient hypophosphatemia in the short term and may have adverse consequences on bone uh, and mineral metabolism in the longer term. Uh, and the patients that I would really worry about are the ones, and the ones that have the, the most problems, are those with inflammatory bowel disease and gastroenterology use, where they're using huge amounts of intravenous iron just to cope with the severe iron deficiency and blood loss. Uh, and in them, I really would worry using ferric proximaltose. Uh, a lot of my patients didn't require a lot of intravenous iron. They, they required a gram, and that would last them for six months or nine months. And these are not patients I think is a high risk, um, particularly since they are used to having high phosphates rather than low phosphates. Uh, I, I think the, the, the phosphate issue is real. Uh, I think it's been slightly overstated. Uh, I haven't switched all my patients to uh, the um, um, monifer. Um, and uh, in the short, if they're not requiring large volumes of iron, uh, I'm still very happy with ferric maltos. I mean, in the pivotal study, of course, we use Venifer, which is the iron sucrose standard of care in dialysis. So that doesn't have any problems with uh, hypophosphatemia. But um, yeah, it's it's a real issue. And we know why it occurs through um, upregulation of uh, FGF23. So um, it's a nice area of science. I, I think it's slightly overstated and, and over worried about in patients who are not exposed to a lot of uh, pharyngite. 
vice versa 10 years ago so we were very uh, thrilled by new phosphate binders that contain iron and to my best understanding now looking back 10 years they did not fully uh, well fulfill all their promises do they really help us to uh, tackle iron deficiency yeah it's a very interesting comment Gunnar, because i was in, i was involved with these 10 years ago and, and they were quite exciting because they, it was like uh, giving two uh, treatments for the, for the price of one almost because they could correct the iron deficiency a bit and they could also uh, reduce the phosphate. So it was thought that they should be. Uh, but interestingly, they were never developed in Europe, so they never they never came to Europe. They remained in uh, in US and uh, Asia, but they never were marketed uh, in in any European country and never were approved in Europe. So um, and then they kind of have um, big, and, and at the time they were regarded as quite innovative and quite exciting and what was the future and, and, and the only thing was there were no outcome studies and that was that was what KDGO commented on or guidelines group they said they're quite exciting but there were no outcome trials we need some outcome trials on them and, and then they, of course they, they just di uh, just died a death a little bit so I mean yeah I mean I, I um, they do correct iron deficiency um, they're, but they're uh, I think with any healthcare system, a lot of it's down to the cost of the drug, and um, they're more expensive than some of the other oral iron therapies. So you then have to say, well, it might reduce phosphate a bit and correct iron. Would am I worth? Is it worth paying more money? And certainly in the UK, uh, the National Health Service and Nice wouldn't be uh, keen, even if they were in Europe, would be keen to approve these drugs if the uh, benefits were not that great and the price was a lot more. Does the UK still follow EMA recommendations for approval of drugs or do you have your own approval now for new drugs? Well, there's the MHRA, which is our medicines uh, and healthcare regulatory. So, so that's, uh, but we still, uh, I, I know it's very sad that we left Europe and, and, and but we still respect the European Medicines Agency, even though we're not in Europe anymore. Uh, EMA does a fantastic job and uh, it was a shame that they had to move uh, from London out with uh, the UK, their head office. But um, so we respect EMA. And uh, it is still part of our overall regulation, uh, regulatory approval um, of medicines. But we also have NICE. So NICE is our government, a UK government uh, authority, because they have to um, look at the cost of the drug and the benefit uh, of the drug in relation to cost. Because obviously every patient in the UK uh, that's a British citizen or whatever is entitled to free health care. Uh, no insurance, no private. Uh, well, they can they can take private. No uh, the, uh, need for any cost to someone's um, uh, health. Uh, it's all free. So because of that, NICE had to be introduced to um, to look at carefully, at, and not just drugs that were approved scientifically in terms of benefit versus risk, but also the the uh, cost benefit of these drugs as well, which is what NICE uh, spends a lot of time doing. So we have MHRA, we have NICE, and we have EMA all, all in the UK. So we're quite rich in that sense. And do you believe that we can expect novel oral iron compounds in the future? So there have been a lot of discussion, new ideas that come forward, and then, in my best understanding, they disappear again. We had had this discussion with Dr. Ada Harley uh, two years ago. Do you think that we will really have novel strategies for better oral iron treatments in the future? Well, I mean, there are agents out there, to name a few, sucrosomial iron, heme iron polypeptide. Uh, these are oral uh, uh, iron compounds, uh, very different from, um, for example, ferrous sulfate. They're absorbed through the gut by different mechanisms uh, compared with the, the standard ferrous iron salts. And therefore, they thought that they would be uh, safer, a better GI uh, tolerance, and, and so on. Um, unfortunately, they haven't done very well. Sucrosomial iron, for example, um, has been used in other uh, conditions of iron deficiency, inflammatory bowel disease. But in CKD, the randomized controlled trials uh, in CKD have been somewhat disappointing. They haven't shown any benefits versus the standard 
ferrous salts and therefore they haven't uh, uh, come into the uh, CKD market at all, uh, despite being available and introduced in some countries and uh, unfortunately they're expensive compared to uh, cheap iron salts, they're, they're expensive drugs and they're marketed with a price tag. And one last question on iron. What sh shall we do with patients who are not anemic, but who have a certain degree of iron deficiency? I'm aware you wrote a review paper on this two years ago. Uh, so what is your current strategy? If you have really a patient who is not anemic, but who has low ferritin or t set shall we treat these patients? So it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And in some ways, I feel in my lifetime, um, the cardiologists have overtaken us. We, we started, we were the experts as nephrologists on, on iron, uh, how to detect iron deficiency. How to treat. Cardiologists come along and they, 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 they use our uh, information and uh, and and they then have now overtaken us and they've got uh, they've shown very convincingly that iron deficiency and heart failure needs to be treated in the presence or absence of anemia we're not there in ckd and you're absolutely right two years ago jay wish and uh, jay wish was the first author in this paper you're referring to uh, which uh, summarized the case for correcting iron deficiency alone in the absence of anemia. And more recently, there was a nice editorial by Dan Coyne in uh, Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology, C. Jason, on um, the um, Affirm HF, the renal subgroup uh, paper that uh, I was first author on, uh, uh, giving the case for uh, if you've got heart failure in CKD, the evidence should, is now overwhelming from the renal subgroup analysis that these patients should be treated without, uh, even without uh, uh, anemia. Um, I'm not sure that uh, is in any guideline yet. And uh, this will be something, again, that the um, KDEGO anemia workgroup will look at carefully and give some data on. My personal recommendation would be if someone's got heart failure uh, and CKD, uh, so cardiorenal syndrome or whatever, that they should receive intravenous iron. I think the benefits are in heart failure now are so strong that there is a case for just correcting iron deficiency, but that is not uh, universally um, uh, acknowledged yet. Did you have some patients in Pivotal that were not anemic, but just low in uh, ferritin and so that they were included into Pivotal without being anemic? Um, we had some at the very start, one or two, but they, as time went on, because this was a four-year study, they then required EPO. I mean, the, the hemoglobin was clamped between 10 and 12. The, the, the physicians in the study had to keep that hemoglobin between 10 and 12. So if it dropped, then they were mandated to start ESA. So we didn't have many patients at the end of the trial that were not on uh, ESA therapy, very few indeed, in fact. So, um, But we did have patients who stopped ESA for a while because the hemoglobin went up to 13. And these dialysis physicians would phone me and say, what do I do here? Um, I've stopped the EPO, but the, uh, the hemoglobin is 13. Uh, do I um, venusect them and get the hemoglobin back down to 10? No, no, you can leave them. And these patients did well. So, I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong. Again, this is going back to Andreas's question about hemoglobin. The hemoglobin 13, as long as you're not an EPO on dialysis, is fine. Uh, and you still correct the iron deficiency in them. That's what the pivotal study showed. You don't leave them with a low ferritin and TSAT, but because the study mandated that you had to, with the iron protocol, you had to give the iron. So that's what we said. Give the iron, just don't give any EPO at all. And they did fine. They did well. So this, again, is further evidence that really the focus in the last few years uh, has been more on uh, iron deficiency is bad for the patients and anemia is of, of course bad as well, but not nearly uh, as bad as we thought uh, 30 years ago when uh, EPO came out. So maybe one more question then on blood transfusions. So you listed all the pros and cons of blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. What shall we do? And this is surely a clinical problem that occurs uh, each day, actually, with people who are on transplant lists, who have severe anemia, who are not yet on EPO and iron. Shall we have different transfusion strategies in these patients compared to non-CKD patients? Uh, should we rather follow the strategies that also apply to non-CKD patients? 
Well, I mean, the transplant issue is a, a, is a concern. I mean, if you have an 80-year-old patient who's never going to get a transplant, you don't need to worry about Butson's fusions. I mean, their life expectancy, particularly on dialysis, is, is worse than many cancers. Uh, so that's fine. It's the young um, patient in their mid-20s or 30 who wants, who's maybe going to get a living donor transplant in the near future, that you really have to be uh, really cautious of, of the blood transfusions. And there have been lots of strategies to try and reduce sensitization of, of blood products uh, with variable uh, success, but not universal. And I think the recommendations are in patients who are hoping to get a kidney transplant, still try to avoid giving uh, blood products unless of course it's uh, life-threatening bleeding or whatever one more topic which is also a each day question in clinical practice what to do with dialysis patients who actually need epo but who have a cancer so in whom we have either a certain degree of risk of progression of cancer because EPO surely is a growth factor, or on the other hand, people who have, say, a myeloma, where hematologists sometimes say to us, well, actually, we should not expect any response by giving EPO in these patients. So would you be concerned by these two disease entities, or would you rather treat them like all other non-oncological uh, CKD patients? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, oncologists still use EPO and iron to correct uh, their anemia, particularly associated with chemotherapy, chemotherapy-induced anemia. You're absolutely right, erythropoietin is a growth factor. I would be very cons I would be nervous of giving these patients the hip hydroxylase inhibitors, the new agents for anemia, if they have malignancy. We have no data on hip hydroxylase inhibition in malignancy at all. But we do have a lot of data on giving EPO and uh, plus or minus iron to uh, cancer patients, uh, not just renal patients with cancer, but also patients just that have cancer anemia. And oncologists have um, treated a lot of patients with uh, with with EPO, and the uh, they, and and the guidelines say that uh, if you still try and keep a hemoglobin between ten and twelve in cancer, the benefits in terms of quality of life and avoidance of transfusions outweighs the risks. That's what the cancer guidelines say. So, I would say a renal patient is the same. If they've got cancer, uh, I would uh, try and keep them between ten and twelve. The problem is they might be resistant to treatment. And then that goes back to what we talked about with Andreas at the very beginning of the presentation, the resistance, and you keep going higher and higher EPO. And of course, a lot of these patients, I've had patients with myeloma, where you just have to give supportive blood transfusions. There's nothing else you can do. EPO is not working. It's not correcting the anemia. It's not even really seeming to reduce the blood transfusions. And therefore, these patients are, are transfusion dependent. So um, the big thing is, theoretically, these patients could do better with hif hydroxylase inhibitors, but we haven't got any data to say whether it's going to make the cancer worse. Uh, so at the moment, I can't give any recommendation in this area. But it's a good question. We, we do, we do, I think we don't know. There's not enough data in this area. And then apparently we cannot discuss any field of renal medicine without discussing SGLT2 inhibitors. Apparently a rather strong um, agent also with uh, regard to hemoglobin levels. If this is mediated by an increase of EPO or a stimulation of HIF, one then questions how comes that we do have these prognostic benefits. And I just saw a few weeks ago a uh, new analysis by Dr. Wanner who suggests that these effects may even explain some of the overall beneficial effects of SGLT2 inhibitors in large clinical trials. But how comes that there may be this benefit? And on the other hand, we do not have any prognostic benefit either by EPO itself or by HIF stabilizers. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. And I mean, the SGLT2 inhibitor story is remarkable. And it is a staggering uh, new therapy in terms of reducing, uh, slowing down uh, renal progression and uh, the cardiovascular benefits, not in 
not only just in cardiac field, but in renal as well, from the DAPA CKD and other trials. Um, uh, the effects on anemia, initially, I remember when they came out and people said, oh, these drugs seem to um, uh, improve the hemoglobin. And it was thought that that was the um, diuretic effect of these drugs. In other words, it was hemoconcentration. And that was why the hemoglobins went up. It's very clear now that it's not just that. It's uh, that that might be part of it. And of course, these these drugs do have a diuretic effect and therefore hemoconcentrate. But they absolutely have an effect on erythropoiesis, uh, and they they uh, enhance erythropoiesis uh, by uh, on mechanisms that aren't exactly clear. Um, they they can replace EPO. Uh, they're not. Uh, uh, I don't think anyone's suggesting you can stop EPO now and just use these drugs now, but they do have that uh, extra effect. How much that contributes to outcomes? Uh, is interesting um, because uh, if they improve outcomes by that mechanism, why haven't we been able to show that with EPO? And that's the that's the, the issue, really. So I, I don't think we know. Uh, the trouble with secondary analysis and post hoc analysis, uh, I have lots of respect for Christoph Vanner, but it is a post hoc analysis. It's, and, and as soon as you have that, uh, you have uh, a hypothesis generating uh, uh, information rather than a direct uh, um, uh, proof that they, that they actually do this. So I think the jury's out in this one. And here comes my last question. So looking into the future, say 12 or 15 years from now, do you believe that we will have completely new fields of anemia treatment and CKD? There's a lot of discussion about hapsidine as a target, but this has also been discussed two decades ago, I think. Do you think we will see really novel fields or will we still treat with EPO and iron in 10 years from now? That's the that's the million dollar question to finish, I suppose. So I I I I I, I am have been in this field for a long time, but I'm not a clairvoyant and I have no crystal ball for the future, I'm afraid. So to be able to predict 12 years is a difficult one, but I'll give it my best shot. So I mean, EPO and iron at the present time, at least we know what we're dealing with. We've 30 or 40 years. We kind of know where we are. And therefore, uh, I, and that's the problem with the HPHIs. They're very new. Now, obviously, in 12 years' time, we'll have more data in HPHIs. Depending on what that data shows, uh, we might be reassured, and maybe that will be great. Uh, in terms of new strategies, antagonizing hepcidin, well, I've I was involved in trials 10, 20 years ago, antagonizing hepcidin. Uh, these drugs were uh, subcutaneous um, uh, injections uh, in dialysis patients. They did immobilize a bit of iron, but they didn't correct anemia particularly. Uh, they were obviously going to be expensive. I never saw how an anti hepcidin strategy would replace what we had with E4.9 because the patients have to inject subcutaneously. Um, they didn't seem to get an improvement in anemia. They got a bit better iron. They were going to be expensive, much more expensive than EPO because it's a new drug. They had to get their cost back. So I, 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 and I, I happen to know, because I worked with some of these companies, that some of the companies gave up their anti hepcidin strategy. And the other thing that was clear is when Pivotal was published, um, it showed that you need a lot of extra iron to have a benefit. And the anti hepcidin approach only gives you a little bit more iron mobilized uh, by antagonizing hepcidin. So I don't think anti hepcidin personally uh, is going to be there in, in 12 years from now, uh, personally. HPHIs, well, they will be around. We just need to see what the data is. And I don't think really with anything new. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have been in this field uh, doing the very earliest studies of recombinant human erythropoietin, which is a blockbuster new treatment in 1980s, late 1980s. Uh, and then we had Darby Point Alpha, and then we pegylated the point in beta, and then we'd hematide for a while, peganizotide, and then we had uh, the HPHIs. And this has been the journey. There's nothing out there that's going on that is exciting. So it, it's almost like the journey's come to an end uh, and that's why I can safely retire, which is what I've done. Well, we definitely need you in the future, so no time for retirement. And <laughs> we're looking forward to, to meeting you for the next webinar. This was excellent. Thanks so much for taking the time, for being our guest, and again, hoping to meet you in the not-too-far future. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Gunnar, and thank you, Andreas.